What if the stories about the Nephilim giants you have ever heard are not as they are told? What if they were not even giants? Or there were other giants who were not the Nephilim? You see, the Hebrew Bible contains three verses that allude to the Nephilim. The Pentateuch is the source of two of them. The first instance occurs just prior to the story of Noah's Ark in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. The text of Genesis 6 verse 4 says this, The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. The same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. So, in actuality, Genesis 6 verses 1 to 6 does not claim that the Nephilim were giants, but rather that they were mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. While Numbers 13 verse 33 reveals that they were giants, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Scripture suggests that they were potentially giants, individuals considerably larger and powerful than usual. The Nephilim were mighty men portrayed in the Old Testament as being extremely huge and physically strong. Some translations of the Hebrew Bible render the term Nephilim as giants, while others leave it untranslated. According to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, this word, translated giants in the King James Version, but retained in the Revised Version, British and American, is found in two passages of the Old Testament one in Genesis 6 verse 4, relating to the Antediluvians, the other in Numbers 13.33, relating to the sons of Anak and Canaan. In the former place the Nephilim are not necessarily to be identified with the children said to be born by the daughters of men to the sons of God, Genesis 6 verses 2 to 4. Indeed, they seem to be distinguished from the latter as they were upon the earth before this unholy commingling took place. But it is not easy to be certain as to the interpretation of this strange passage. In the second case they clearly represent men of gigantic stature, in comparison with whom the Israelites felt as if they were grasshoppers. This agrees with Genesis 6 verse 4, the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Septuagint, therefore, was warranted in translating by Gigantes. When debating the specifics of the Nephilim in Christian circles today, there is nearly always disagreement. Is there a clear way to identify who the Nephilim were? Theology professors and scholars find this topic fascinating. Although the actual identity and nature of the Nephilim remain unknown, Scripture provides us with some indications regarding the identities of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. The Hebrew word Nephilim is translated as giants in the King James Version, whereas it is simply transliterated as Nephilim in the Jewish Publication Society's translation. The confusion surrounding the meaning of Genesis 6 verse 4, which asks us to believe either that the Nephilim are the sons of God or that their progeny are the mighty men of old, men of renown, complexes our understanding of themselves. P.W. Coxon and Richard Hess both interpret it to suggest that the Nephilim are the progeny. In the second, eleven of the twelve spies characterize the Anakites, a refate tribe, as descended from the Nephilim in Numbers 13 verses 32 to 33. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. There is one further verse outside the Pentateuch that alludes to Nephilim in an indirect manner, Ezekiel 32 verses 17 to 32. Ezekiel 32 verse 27 is very important since it contains a passage whose interpretation is up for debate. The word is red gibberim naflim, fallen warriors or fallen gibberim, since the usual vowels were inserted to the text during the medieval era. However, other scholars interpret the phrase as gibberim nephilim, nephilim warriors or warriors, nephilim. Ronald S. Hendel suggests that the phrase refers to warriors, the Nephilim and is a reference to Genesis 6 verse 4. According to Hendel, the poem says, They lie with the warriors, the Nephilim of old, who descended to Sheol with their weapons of war. They place their swords beneath their heads and their shields upon their bones, for the terror of the warriors was upon the land of the living. However, rather than using the phrase Nephilim, Brian R. Doak suggests reading the term as the Hebrew verb fallen, Nephilim which is still a clear allusion to the Nephilim story as found in Genesis. The term Gigantes is translated as so in the oldest translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint, 
which was written in the 3rd or 2nd century BC. Greek mythology described Gigantes as creatures that were not always very large, but rather very strong and aggressive. The Latin translation known as the Vulgate, which was composed in the 4th or 5th century AD, followed the decision taken by the Greek translators and translated the Greek word instead of the Hebrew Nephilim. From then on, the legend of the enormous offspring of God's sons and human daughters permeated later medieval Bible translations. It is another matter entirely that the Greek translators chose to translate the Hebrew Nephilim as Greek Gigantes. The term the fallen ones in Hebrew is Nephilim. A literal translation into Greek would be Peptikos. This word does indeed occur in the Septuagint version of Ezekiel 32 verses 22 to 27. Therefore, it would appear that the Septuagint writers intended for their Greek listeners to understand and find significance in the phrase they chose, rather than just translating the foreign word into Greek. The Greek translators noted many commonalities given the nuanced meaning of the Nephilim that arose from the three interrelated biblical passages, the human, divine hybrids in Genesis 6, autochthonous people in Numbers 13, and ancient warriors doomed in the underworld in Ezekiel 32. First and foremost, being a hybrid of the heavenly and human, Nephilim and Gigantes shared an unclear identity. They were also looked upon with both moral disdain and intrigue. Second, both were portrayed as having chaotic traits and threatening both humans and gods with great danger. Finally, it was stated that both Gigantes and Nephilim were descended from Earth and ended up closed in the underworld. These creatures had an obvious connection to the underworld. They were described as great giants, whose height was 300 cubits in one Enoch. Given that a cubit is equivalent to 18 inches, 46 centimeters, their height would be 140 meters, 450 feet. In Quran 26 verse 130, the prophet Hud compares the inhabitants of Ad to Jibrim, Hebrew, Jabrin, most likely alluding to the biblical Nephilim. The tallest of the Ad people are claimed to be 100 feet, 30 meters, tall, making them giants. However, Islamic mythology holds that some of the Ad were too tall to be drowned, therefore they were not completely destroyed by the flood. Instead, after they disregarded more warnings, God annihilated them. They were cast into the lowest reaches of hell once they died. The Nephilim, who are they? Four distinct theories exists. Scholars from Christianity and Judaism have disagreed for millennia about the identity of the Nephilim. Theory 1. According to this theory, fallen angels interacted with the daughters of men, giving rise to the Nephilim, a hybrid of a human and a supernatural person. Theory 2. According to this theory, some people believe that after possessing men, demons or fallen angels had relationships with the daughters of men, giving rise to the Nephilim. Theory 3. Some scholars hold a third viewpoint known as the Sethite view. The sons of God are the descendants of Seth, according to the Sethite view. Theory 4. Lastly, the minority believes that the sons of God were just flawed human beings. Nephilim Theory 1. Humans and Angels Offspring. The idea that the sons of God were fallen angels who had relationships with the daughters of men, Genesis 6 verses 1 to 6, giving birth to the Nephilim, has gained more support in modern times. This theory holds that the Nephilim were the progeny of human women and fallen angels. The majority opinion in the church right now is this one. Support for the hypothesis. Job 1 verse 6 is cited by those who hold this position. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Job 38 verse 7 adds, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. In reference to this line, the identical phrase used in Genesis 6 is used in these verses. In the past, theologians have understood the sons of God to be angels, which makes perfect sense in the context of these words. Jude 1 verses 6 to 7 is a key text from the Bible that is used to support this theory. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. According to Jude 1 verses 6-7, some angels, who had fallen, 
went after alien flesh. Objections to the theory. The argument that angelic entities lack the DNA necessary to mate with humans is one argument against this viewpoint. It is impossible for them to have children since they are spiritual beings. Once more, this is presuming that angels are not able to share human DNA. Some would contend that it is conceivable because Genesis 19 verses 1 to 13 depicts the appearance of two angels in human form. Who is to say they weren't fully capable of reproducing? Nephilim Theory 2, Descendants of Seth the Sehite Belief, which holds that the Nephilim descended from Seth, is gaining ground among researchers and is presumably the most widely held belief in the church today. Here, the term sons of God refers to the righteous branch of Seth, Genesis 5, who married women descended from Cain's line, in defiance of God. This is why some people think Cain's familial line was not the only one with these women. The women who went into the Seth lineage refused to fully submit to God and instead worshipped other deities. As a result, the progeny fell away and embraced the global system. Jewish scholars have embraced this perspective, according to Jewish historical works and literature dating back to the first century. Distinguished scholars and theologians who have occupied this role include St. Augustine and John Calvin. In order to maintain a pure lineage, we presume that every member of the group from Seth to Noah, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, obeyed God. Nephilim Theory 3, Angels of Death Possessing Human Offspring Since some of us are aware of the reality of demonic possession in the modern world, this third view, that fallen angels possessed men, may start to resonate with us when we talk about it. Witchcraft is genuine, from Hollywood films to folklore all throughout the world. The main query is, can the sons of God, if they are humans, be possessed? The Bible contains no evidence to substantiate the notion that God's children are susceptible to demonic possession. Fourth Nephilim Theory, Children of Fallen Men The last perspective holds that the so-called sons of God were decent men who wed immoral women. Common males, not of the line of Seth. The descendants of this union, known as the Nephilim, fell away. Engage in a theoretical debate. We must return once more to the fact that the meaning of the term Nephilim, in relation to the verb series to fall, Hebrew word, napal, is still up for controversy. This perspective is predicated on the verb series, napal, which denotes falling or falling, backing for the hypothesis. Scripture, both before and after the flood, is in line with this viewpoint. This means that these descendants were fallen men prior to the flood. These Nephilim continue to appear after the deluge, in which God annihilated everything but Noah's family, Numbers 13 verse 33. The Nephilim are therefore just fallen men. What was the Nephilim's height? The height of the Nephilim is one of the few physical features about which the Bible is silent. Because of this, any information regarding their height is mostly conjectural and not supported by clear scriptural accounts. There are many different hypotheses and interpretations concerning the identity and nature of the Nephilim, However, it is difficult to come to firm conclusions on their physical attributes due to the absence of specific details in the biblical text. After the flood, are the Nephilim still alive today? Many people raise questions like this one. How are the Nephilim still alive if God flooded the earth, killing every human being save Noah's family? Academics have answered in a variety of ways. One way to answer this is to say that since the Nephilim were giants and the progeny of fallen angels, sons of God, and human women, fallen angels carried on having children with human women even after the deluge. The sons of God are fallen men, to put it another way. Following the deluge, certain righteous men mated with various wicked women, procreating the Nephilim once more. Thank you for your support.